Stone Pizza is the new TV reboot of the dystopian sci-fi film, also based on the French graphic novel. It follows the passengers of a 1001 car speeding train careening through the frozen wasteland of Earth, carrying the remnants of humanity. Um, I'm Rob LeCurry, a senior editor of Gold Derby. I'm here for showrunner Graham Manson. Graham, where does the show sit alongside the graphic novel and Bong Joon-ho's earlier adaptation? Um, well, I think, you know, thematically it sits, um, it sits, uh, right beside those two things. We, uh, mm -hmm. I came to the, I came to the franchise, uh, through, through director Bong's movie. Um, and I love the kinetic energy of the movie. Um, it's a very bizarre action movie with great visual flair, um, and, uh, a tremendous amount of message. And then, uh, and then, um, you know, Director Bong took that from the graphic novels. They are deeply political, um, and you know, uh, a, uh, a, a, a at its core, though the novels and the and the movie are 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 action adventures um, with a political message. And I think um, that's what uh, that's what attracted me to it because I think that's a um, it's an admirable quality to try and uh, have in a television series, especially a genre series. Absolutely, especially in these current times that we're in. Um, whenever I'm watching a series that's an adaptation, I always wonder how challenging it is to let it stand on its own. Um, what are some of the more material ways that you think this show departs from the source material and kind of does its own thing? Well, I think the big difference with, um, you know, with with um, serialized television is how how deep you can go with the character stories. So, you know, season one, we're really just getting started. We're really just getting to know these characters. If it's going to run a, a bunch of seasons, the audience is going to be coming back for uh, a great character drama. And that's, um, that's uh, the real thing that was a real challenge and really amazing is to put a calendar uh, or a, a character drama within this within this train in this in this pressure cooker of these confines in claustrophobic space um, and see how people uh, react. Yeah, um, when I spoke to Jennifer a week or so ago, she mentioned the same thing that you go in thinking, of course, that it's an exciting uh, sci-fi uh, entertainment, but it's really at its core about these characters that we start to get to know and some of them we love and some of them maybe we don't. And I wondered then, because I think I've seen you say this in the past, that there's no clear-cut uh, clear good guys and bad guys on this show. Do you stand by that? Do you still think that is the case? It's a bit more nuanced than that. Uh no i i do feel it's the case um you know um uh jennifer so deliciously plays you know the villain for the first half of the season um yeah. but as we slowly get to know her and we understand the 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 pressures and the moral dilemmas she has to face for all of our survival we begin to understand that um and likewise with leighton when um you know he fights his way up and he manages to um be someone in a uh, position of power, um, he understands the weight of those decisions, uh, and that um, you know that the the moral zone of leadership can be gray at times. That's exactly what I love, especially about the Melanie character, because on any other show, like it's hard to put this to you, but I would have I thought immediately, oh, she's the villain. She's, she's the bad one. She's the pretending and she's actually really nefarious. And it's absolutely not the case. You could, and it's the perfect example of, as you say, leadership, having to make choices that not necessarily are going to fit everybody on the train, which is a microcosm for the world that we live in. Um, so how challenging was it though, then to, to give us this character who is new to this particular show it's not from the source material and make us kind of go along this journey where we thought she probably wasn't really doing the right thing but she actually has her heart in the right place well i think that's uh it's really a matter of sort of peeling back um who jennifer is and you know understanding her relationships first of all we get to understand her relationships with the engineers on the train 
Um, and then later we get to understand the root cause of why she stole the train to begin with. Um, and, uh, and this is, um, the real deep, her real deep personal story and each character on the train has it. Each person has this traumatic event that saw them lose everyone in their lives. And then the world as we know it completely as they boarded a train and made this decision, were lucky enough or, or perhaps unlucky enough to get on this train. Um, they all had a story. And I think, I think that's another great thing for this, for this series is that those personal stories, we can go and we can keep going back and we can open up a character that we haven't seen yet and, and find out who they were before they got on this train. That's certainly a really interesting journey and one that Jennifer did such a wonderful nuanced job with this season. Absolutely. Um, so you, you did touch on this earlier, but the show is also deeply political. It has a lot to say about class and social injustice and other issues, even climate change. I, it was immediately came to mind when I first saw the pilot. Um, are you excited about, um, you know, maybe resonating with audiences on that, on that level, as well as telling story about human beings and characters. You, you just broke up a little bit at the beginning. Can oh, you repeat no that? Um, yeah, well, it was really just more about the show. It says a lot about social injustice and class, as well as telling a story about human beings. Are you excited about that, that aspect of the show and having being able to say something kind of meaningful, you know, about politics and culture? Yeah, I I am excited about that. It's one of the main reasons I really wanted to um, uh, take a run at Snowpiercer is because uh, it has a deep um, story of class divide and, uh, at its at its core. Um, it's about imbalance and privilege and um, incarceration and immigration. These things just just ring really true right now. And, you know, they, they, they should really ring true in any age. Um, but here now in this, in this uh, time of COVID, we can see the divides uh, as plain as day. And it is the underprivileged that pay the heaviest cost for these, um, you know, disasters. Uh, it, it's always been. Uh, so, and, you know, we see the, um, machinations of disaster capitalism um, moving right now, you know. Uh, did you think we could be so callous? Uh, think again. It's so true. And the beauty of what you're able to do, I think even you, you could say the same thing for Orphan Black, your previous um, series, is that people can start, like people can learn a lesson or perhaps maybe learn something about humanity while also enjoying the ride um so you're doing both it's not you're not taking a medicine and so that's actually a really huge privilege for someone like yourself who can bring that to audiences don't you think well uh yeah i've been we've been talking about it a, a bit lately you know it's um uh it is a dark property the graphic novels and director bong's movie they're they're dark and violent and 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 we're violent as well um and and we have a darkness, but there's a reality to, you know, TNT is, it's a TNT show. There's a reality to how dark you can be. And once yeah. you, once you understand that, the job becomes, how do we um, create an entertaining action adventure that's going to get a mainstream audience? And then how do we put big ideas in there? How do, how, what can we smuggle over the wall as it were and try to get um people to see and think and and feel these issues of class division um uh and privilege and and maybe um and maybe even uh a, a revolution in in all its guises um both uh be that um uh, uh revolutionary or internal and i think it's in you know uh, revolutions begin internally first, and this is certainly a time to uh, to start thinking on those. Uh, uh, if, if you're in quarantine, how do you change? Absolutely. Um, given your previous work, both on film and in TV, 
Um, to me, it, it appears that you're comfortable in a world that is darker and grittier and dystopian. Why is that? Why do you keep going back to that genre? Do you find it's just a goldmine for storytelling? Why are you comfortable in that space? Um, it's yeah, it's um, it's a very imaginative um, space. Uh, this kind of genre, um, and it. Uh, it, it can be a, um, you know, you can tell a broad and entertaining story, but it can also be, be high concept. I've also, mm -hmm. I've always loved that uh, about sci-fi from the earliest, you know, from reading H.G. Wells' Time Machine and things like that when I was a kid. That was those flights of imagination that made you look at your own, um, at, at your own times. Uh, I, I just, uh, I find that, an endless source of creativity and um, and inspiration. So, you know, I, I'm I'm working. I work in other. I work in many genres, from from yeah. half hour comedy uh, to uh, sports movies to you know everything. Um, it's one of the great sort of uh, joys of being of growing of being a Canadian screenwriter is we're jack of all trades. But I keep. Yeah coming back to um to sci-fi because it because of its big ideas and you know because i love to watch it too yeah going back to the way the show um developed over the years um it did face some challenges in development uh, and then you took the reins how different is this version that we've seen to the product as it originally was conceived well, I can't speak really too much to the to the to the original, but um, uh, 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 or the uh, original crack at the TV series. Um, but you know, it was it was with this cast. So mm -hmm. my biggest challenge in coming on was I was coming on to a show that was already that had already been working for a year. Um, yeah. But um, the main thing for me was to gain the trust of the actors and to uh, pitch my version of the world in that tone and try to get the actors um, on board. Uh, and, um, you know, I was, I was very fortunate that um, Jennifer, Jennifer and David were, were very open enough to um, really uh, creating new characters. They were they were in the same position. There was there were the the man from the tale and the woman from the from first class. Yeah. But it was a different world. Um, the first thing I I wanted to do was to rebuild the sets um, to make them a little more oppressive um, and and scaled to uh, allow claustrophobia. Um, you know, some people might be might think you can't be claustrophobic on television, but I happen to love it. I think it's a visceral <laughs> um, sensation for an audience. Um, but then, of course, Snowpiercer has this terrific thing where you open a door and you're in a in a wonderfully amazing room that you never thought could exist on a train. And that's that's really one of the joys. I'm so glad you said that. You preempted my next question, which is that this show is obviously very internal because it's on a train. You don't have a lot of scope to be in the great outdoors and you do mix it up depending on how further up the train you're getting that is, is more grand the sets become, but it is so claustrophobic. And how does that dynamic have an impact on the way the show is filmed? Because you, you, your use of space must be very important. You've got to account for every single square meter. Um. Well, uh, the bit, you know, it really starts with our first season production de production designer, um, and uh, uh, um, and and Barry Robeson. Um, really, we talked deeply about how do we define the classes from one another. How does the train feel? How does it move? We um, designed the train or designed a number of the cars on, uh, on the train on uh, modified shipping containers so you can move these cars around on wheels and actually link them up. And so you can walk down the barrel of, wow. the, uh, of the train and pass from car to car through the links. And the whole time there's, um, you know, there's, there's grips outside shaking the train so that the actors are all moving in time and it is a very uh, tactile set to be on for sure the actors you know feel like they've been on a train when they when they get off it yeah. um 
uh, and and then you know it's it's really really wonderful to have that to be able to be in the tail and to be so crowded and and tight and have the actors all really close together and crowded in and this really a gulag touch situation which is very mm -hmm. dark and claustrophobic and then you go up to a first car first class car where you know one family or or one couple might have an entire carriage to themselves as well as the spa car or the basketball yeah. car or the whatever you can imagine car because keep imagining it we'll probably build it <laughs> i know that's what i'm looking forward to and i also really love the um external shots i know they're obviously uh, vfx matte paintings but they're beautiful to look at and i'm always looking out for what part of the world you're in at what certain time are you conscious of doing that for the audience um, so could you repeat that? Um, so I love the outdoor VFX shots, right? And I'm always looking forward to seeing where you are on the planet. And uh, are you conscious of doing of, of of presenting parts of the world as icy wastelands? Because it's kind of like a little a nice little touch that we look forward to. Um, yeah, it it is really fun to do that with the writers at the beginning of of the, of each season and go, where are we going to go this year? Um, and you know in the in the first episode we made a point of well of starting the train passing through a destroyed vancouver as a yeah. you know a bit of a um a shout out to our crew and to ourselves here making the show and then we go south and we go down through south america and we come up through the amazon which was an an interesting um environment to create um and our um vfx producer um uh uh jeff scott came uh came with me from orphan black so uh so he's having a great time because on orphan black it was all about making the vfx invisible and this is all about putting them out there as much as we can from um you know uh, i described the sets and they are very um uh physical so we don't do a lot of huge blue screen stuff. We'll do blue screens in the distance and we'll blue, do blue screens out the windows. Um, but those environments uh, and those sort of like um, the master shots of the train moving through uh, um, a destroyed area, those are a lot of fun to come up with. The, the um, whether you're in mountains or you're driving through a city or you're through farmland, that that world you know really um helps us feel the oppression inside the train if yeah. you know, you look outside and you know you put one finger out there it's going to freeze right off yeah I, that's one of the, my favorite things about the show to be honest i love it um now final question is this i wanted to go back a few years uh, obviously uh because you shepherded orphan black throughout its uh, its trajectory, and you're about to embark on a new journey with Snowpiercer, but back then, that was such a critical darling, and then Tatiana Maslany won the Emmy for Best Actress, uh, and she thanked you and mentioned how lucky she was to be on a show that puts women at, in the centre. And, you you know, you've, you've done that again, but take us back to how that show was such a critical darling and winning awards like that and being at the Emmys and having her win like that. Well, you know, Orphan Black was a really like a unique um, little thing for all of us. And uh, just just a couple of days ago, just yesterday, we um, uh, we all got together again and had a, um, a cast read through for charity. And it was just yeah. terrific to see all those guys again. It, it probably took too long because we were laughing so hard. <laughs> um, but um, it was great not only to see them, but great to see those, those great to hear those scripts and um, see John again. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a much different beast than, than um, Snowpiercer, that's for sure. It really felt like a little family, let's um, build a stage and put up a sheet and we'll put on a show. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we had to hire, um, you know, our, our deal was such that our, our, our cast had to be entirely Canadian um, or UK. So, you know, cast and crew, it's a, it's a Canadian made show, even though we were on BBC America, we had our American network and it really, it really felt like that. Um, it felt like, holy cow, how did we, how did this happen to us? You know, and 
we just loved going to Comic Con as a group and everything. Um, so it's just a was was a was a great experience, and I think as all of us have moved on, we realize just how great it is now, even more than when we were in it. You know, it was very unique. Um, so who knows? Maybe there'll be uh, maybe that's reason for to remount some kind of working black something sometime. Oof, people are going to get nuts if they hear that. Um, Graham, thanks so much for your time today. Snowpiercer is really enjoyable, and I'm look- I haven't seen the finale yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. And, uh, and thanks again for your time, and good luck. Thank you very much. 